Okay, thank you for being here. Um, so this is joint work with uh, several people. They kind of cut off here. Um, so mainly... Uh, okay, thank you. Um, and this talk is about unsupervised learning. And the main areas of unsupervised learning, one is um, representation, and the other one is um, generating samples. And um, a sweet spot uh, there is autoencoders, which are kind of a hybrid model, uh, which can do both. And um, what we are going to do is, uh, I'm just explaining you, walk you through like encoders, autoencoders, variational autoencoders, and then how to use optimal transport for similar tasks. And this has, of course, been done before, and we're trying to improve on this. So what are autoencoders? Autoencoders um, are just, um, it's about representation. You have images, you put them through a neural network, have some latent code, and then you're trying to reconstruct it. So you look at the output, you subtract your input, and you're trying to minimize um, the reconstruction error. And this bottleneck in the middle is then um, um, ensures that you have some more compact representation. So we're talking about um, autoencoders. Um, so we have images, we reconstruct them, and now we want to generate something. So what you could do is uh, you put a um, distribution in the latent space, uh, you send it through the decoder, and you get an image. And of course, the problem is you have to do it in a, in a way that it's consistent with your data. Um, here you see some generated images. So and how to do it, it was like first done with variation auto encoders, as I um, recall. Um, and how you do it is you start have a joint model, you have a prior on your latent space, and you have a generator. Um, and then you're trying to optimize such that um, the likelihood of the data given this model, the marginal likelihood on the image space is maximized. And this is usually difficult to optimize. So what you do is you introduce the elbow, as most of you know, and which consists here, the first term you can see is like a, a reconstruction error plus some matching of the encoder with the prior. And it was reported that this makes problems. Um, one point is if you minimize like this kohlberg leibler distance, um, there, then the dependency on the image kind of goes down, and also that um, you kind of encourage blurry images. And um, the difference between like the true, um, the true objective and this uh, um, elbow objective is given by um, the distance between the kohlberg leibler distance between these um, uh, posterior distributions. And there might not be like. These might not be the same, and they also might not have the same um, maximum. So, and optimal transport was uh, then introduced um, by the authors of the Wasserstein autoencoders in this setting. It was, of course, used before much in other contexts. Um, and what is optimal transport? Optimal transport aims to match distributions. You have two marginal distributions. Let's say on the left side, you have so two distributions of your data. On the right-hand side, you see the distributions of your generator. And you see, um, you see them in like one-dimensional representations to make it clearer. And but you also see the pictures. So left are the true pictures, on the right hand the generated one. And we now want to have like a framework which kind of relates two marginal distributions to each other. So an optimal transport is exactly this. So you have two marginals, left and right, and you see them down on the left and one on the top. And the question is, how can you relate them? You can relate them by having a joint distribution, such as the marginals are the ones you're actually looking at. And here you see like uh, the joint distribution, and if you project them to the upper part, you see this is exactly the distribution um, from P. And if you go to the, to the left, you have like the distribution of the generator. So they're exactly the marginals. And um, this is also called the transport plan, because you're transporting mass from, um, from the left point to the right, and you see how basically how probable they are in a joint setting. And this is, of course, not unique. You can have several of these distributions. Here and on the top right, you see two of these. One is basically um, an independent. You just multiply the um, marginal distributions, and you get a joint one. 
And on the right hand side, you have, you have like strong dependencies, almost deterministic dependencies, because almost around the graph. And what optimal transport distances now do is, they first you have to say how, how costly it is to transport one point mass on this um, one marginal, let's say here's a blue, the G, to one of the other ones, how costly it is, like how close they are, how this like really like transport, how your transport is around. And this is usually done, here we have like the cost function, C of X and Y, and usually it's kind of a metric. So you, uh, the further it is away, the more costly it is. So now you have these two distributions, and um, then you can look at what is the, what is the cheapest, cheapest transport plan uh, such that um, this one marginal like, is transported to the other one. And this is called uh, optimal transport distance. You see it here on the, on the bottom. So you have to take the minimum of all these transport plans, um, which gives on average basically the lowest cost. So and here you can um, so and if you now want to do um, generative modeling, then we look at these uh, optimal transport distance between like the true distribution and the generated distribution, and we minimize it with respect to the generator because we want to make them close to each other. So you can do this usually. The cost function here is like the norm, the L2 norm. You can use a metric and so on, and um, here you have like a representation of the generator. You sample from the latent code, so you put it to the generator, and then you have an image. And these images should look realistic and reflect the true distributions. So the challenge, of course, is finding the cheapest transfer plan. And this is very difficult even in high dimensional settings. So the standard way to do this with algorithm you see later is, is dependent on the dimension and has like suffers from curse of dimensionality. So and in Wasserstein outer encoders in the paper, <coughs> The authors, what they did is they rephrased the setting. Instead of looking at joints, they're kind of cutting off looking at the marginal plus the conditional. And then they optimize here, as you can see in the blue, um, in the blue, like the blue equation, that they use all encoding distributions, all conditional distributions basically, such that the aggregated distribution matches exactly the prior. And that is a hard constraint. So rephrase it in the setting. So they introduced the encoding distribution to, to make this matching happen. And the problem is still to optimize this. And how like this hard constraint was enforced was by using a Lagrangian multiplier and some divergence in the latent space. And from there on, they, um, they had like, several choices to make. And a lot of questions stayed open. First of all, what kind of um, divergence do I use in latent space? What kind of um, Lagrange multiplier do I take? Then, like, the optimization was taken over all encoding distributions, encoding, like, conditional distributions, and they're like, there's a huge space. The so question is, what can I use in practice? People want to use neural networks in practice or something. So this was still open. And also, from, from going from there to there, one leaves basically the space of optimal transport. So and one of our contributions were in this paper is that we could, um, we could actually address all these problems by saying I could, if I take a matching, so if I take P Wasserstein distance, so I take P power divergences, um, and I use the corresponding one in the latent space, and I use like this hyperparameter to be at least the Lipschitz constant, constant of the generator, and I make sure that there's this P root there, then um, we have the equality of this um, for this um, P Wasserstein distance in um, on the image space. Basically, we transfer it to some reconstruction error and this latent space matching with a P corresponding um, P Wasserstein distance. And also, what was not ensured by the Lagrangian multiplier before is that this is actually in lower and an upper bound. So the actual objective was not ensured to be matched in the previous work. But here it is, so we have like this equality of the infimum there. So it's lower bound and upper bound. And um, what we could also show is using deep results from so mongo kantrovic duality and Hornick's um, universal approximator theorems that uh, we can reduce the function class to make it much smaller and even use deterministic neural networks in theory. 
So this kind of reduces the function class and basically reflects the function class people use in practice. So this was our theoretical contributions. And still, now we have like reduced um, the matching in the image space to matching in the latent space. So we are still having a Wasserstein distance there, but it's lower dimensional. And there are several now, several versions how to do this out there. There's also like a talk on Thursday, I guess, where people have now improved methods to compute Wasserstein distances. So, um, so like just to compare, what does it mean, Wasserstein distance? We said it's a transport plan. So um, it's basically in combinatorial assignment problems. So we have one distribution, they're given here by the red ones. These are like our encoder points, like you take image, we bring it into the latent space, and we sample from the prior distribution, that's are these blue ones. And we kind of have to match them. That's basically what it does, if you do it on samples. So what does it do is, we like had like, let's say a hypersphere, and these points are there, the blue ones are from the, from the prior, the red ones are our, um, the images mapped into the latent space. And now we have to match them. That basically boils down to finding the right permutation. So we have to assign them. We have to match the blues and the red ones, like this one. And this is not optimal. So better would be, when that was a Hungarian algorithm does, a combinatorial algorithm, is it finds the one which is closest. And so basically, it's now like a regression problem. So you first give it a label, and you, the algorithm does like finds the best label, and then it's basically standard supervised learning, standard regression. So you now um, want to move um, the red ones to the blue ones. You do it like this. That's what the Hungarian algorithm does. So and the problem is, of course, like I, I use this because standard methods, and it's easy to visualize what it means. The problem is that it doesn't scale well. And uh, one solution to do it better is the Syncon algorithm, which is now analyzed very thoroughly, um, which uses um, an algorithm which does soft assignment, which is basically you have the red one, you assign it still to the blue one, but also a little bit to the others, a little bit um, to one below. So you have kind of an, um, instead of using basically permutation, you use doubly stochastic matrices, so it's kind of a convex combination of permutations and you're going basically from a discrete space to a continuous space. So you can differentiate through this algorithm, and then it's, you can use standard uh, autograd methods. So we use this, and it's thoroughly analyzed, and now we have like this hyperparameter, which kind of relaxes, which relaxes, says how much you relaxed uh, the strong assignments. So and then this gives you the Syncon algorithm, and that's why we call the Syncon autoencoder. And then we did some experiments on um, MNIST and CELEB-A with uniform primer on hypersphere or Gaussian. And we had some results. Um, so basically, if you compare um, MNIST with BAE, that um, we get like comparable FID score, but the reconstruction error is lower. And on CELEB-A, it's similar. We get like very good um, FID score and compared to other outer encoder methods, we have to say. So then we have extrapolations on the left, interpolations, and samples. Um, I think it's not very clear. Okay, that was the synchron autoencoder, and I thank you very much. <laughs>